uh, we have the first record of a Navro celebrated at the court of uh, Emperor Akbar in 1581 where Baduni uh, recounts how, and this the manuscript is at the Medjirana Library, how Baduni recounts how not only was uh, Navro celebrated, but the fire and the sun were bowed to by all the courtiers. Uh, now let me introduce Shenaz Italia. Uh, she is a very well-known filmmaker. She has been somebody who has worked with the BBC. She has participated in the making of Ben Kingsley's Gandhi and many, many great films. Uh, she grew up while Delhi changed from a small government town into a metropolitan city. And she's had a ringside view of Connaught Place and the way in which that little circle which was called the pearl necklace, changed into the great huge NCR with millions of people. The other thing, Sheni Italia, and we use Sheni and Sherry so that we don't confuse the world, uh, Sheni Italia is known for, is her huge, massive contribution to the welfare of animals. Uh, Freni Kodaiji and Shenaz Italia started a small sort of uh, movement called the Dogs of Connaught Place, which has now grown into Dog Matters. I have to say, I have never seen people work so hard as they did through the COVID pandemic when everything was shut to ensure that the dogs who were completely lost and bereft because their usual places were closed, those dogs were fed. They were working night and day, in fact, at the Delhi Parsi Anjuman to cook on the huge big uh, stoves we had over there in order to feed them. And of course, Jenny got very ill during that time and yet they continued. Kudos to them. Thank you, Shanaz and Freni for looking after all the animals which we, whom we all love and welcome to Friday Forum. I know you have a lot to say, so Go ahead, and you've got a lot of friends already here with you. I also want to welcome Zenobia, who's joining us from America. Zenobia Panthaki is also a Delhi girl, though she's uh, been an army wife. She's known Sam Maniksha at first hand level and written a brilliant book about him. And she is going to be joining us. She is joined, has already joined us live from the US. I can see Rusi Uncle Sorabji, who is the great absolute encyclopedia on Delhi, is here with us. And we're going to have his sister, Mani Thakur from Gurgaon, also joining us briefly on this program. Chenaz Italia, welcome. Thank you for being part of uh, Friday Forum. And please go ahead. Thank you so much, Sherry. And thank you especially for such a generous introduction. And thank you, Zanob. Zanob is my co-host. Zanob is from Delhi, as uh, Sherry told you. And she passed out of Miranda House in 1970. And after working for an international organization here, then joined the World Bank, with whom, we were, with whom she worked for 28 years, and is still a consultant with them. So Zanob will kind of fill in the time between the old part and the history, hopefully, that I can manage to convey, and the transition into the modern Delhi and NCR. There's a saying in Gujarati, Je chare te fare, which basically means that whoever goes far out to graze will get the greenest grass. It's really very strange when we talk about Parsis because it's always, Ari, you're from Bombay, aren't you? And I keep saying, no, 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 no. I'm born and brought up in Delhi. My father was from Hyderabad. My grandfather was from Firozpur. And they said, oh, really? So one just questions, why and when did the Parsis actually come to Delhi? And also, why did they come? In the course of reading, I've come to realize 
that Parsis went two ways. 90% of them went to Bombay. The other 10% from Gujarat actually decided to be either more adventurous or that there were reasons like apparently there was a famine or there weren't jobs to be had and they chose to go further afield. And it was also a spirit of adventure and entrepreneurship, which I have to say runs across the board with Parsis. The other very interesting thing about Parsis is that though they blended in completely, they had an instinct wherein they knew that they had to be linguistically and technically educated. And they tried to do that because being such a minuscule community, if you want to move on, this is what you have to do. And the linguistic ability helped them tremendously during the time of the British. So really from 1857, <clears throat> when the East India Company and the British in a sense took over, the Delhi's, Delhi slowly became a destination for the Parsis. Now, the early Parsis came, as per tradition, to run liquor shops. And they were very smart. They totally undercut the Brits. So the liquor, the best champagne, the best cigars were always those half a paisa or two kauris, as you call them. At that time, the currency were shells as well. And of course, they did tithing business. They also realized that it was important to be part of um, co construction activity. And they realized that it was also important to be part of um, things like being clerks or being part of uh, the administration. So slowly, they started with that. In 1863, there was this question about whether the railway line, which hadn't touched much of the north, should have a major junction in Meerut or should it be Delhi? A Parsi was very much part of the committee who decided that the railway line should actually go through Delhi because it was going to become, so they felt, a very essential part of the community. Now, let me show you the map of Delhi as it was then. Just hold on, please. Oops, I seem to have lost my uh, just a bit. Ah, are you all getting the map of Delhi? Yes, we can yeah? see it. Yeah. So now, yeah. basically, forget about the southern part. Maybe we can make it into full screen. Would you? Uh, I'll, I'll try and zoom in a bit. To uh, the, uh, the bottom, uh, next to the minus sign, the slideshow. At the bottom. Sorry, I'm not sure if I can make this. But anyway, basically, it gives you an idea. I'm going to put my cursor around. So all this was old day. Right? And that was Kashmiri Gates, Civil Lines. And this was to become New Delhi. Anyway, moving on. They found, <clears throat> the people, I mean the Brits at that time, found obviously that we were a community that deserved to have its own little space, so to speak. And so, oops, uh, why isn't this moving? Here we go. So in 1863, we were actually given a tiny plot of land outside the walled city. So this was outside what is now Delhi Gate. And there we had a little, but we could be made a little graveyard. And also that's where a lot of the festivities like Navdos and, um, you know, maybe small little gambars and meetings were held. Oddly enough, See, this exists to this day. It is very much part of our Delhi Parsi Anjuman complex. You will see over here that they call it the Parsi Tower of Silence. 
Now, why did the Parsis not have the what is really the Tower of Silence in Delhi? I haven't actually been able to find an answer to that. I think it's not because there was a paucity of vultures or it was not enough heat. I think there was just, I feel maybe it was a way of establishing a space. My great, 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 this is the graveyard as it stands. It had about um, 42 graves. It has about 42 graves. And as I said, my great, 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 great aunt, after whom my mother was named, is also buried here. Anyhow, now let's move on to the Parsi community and where they stayed in old Delhi. This is a picture of my grandparents with my mother. This is their house in an area called Pool Mithai, which is actually Mithai Ka Pool, and it is still a metro station. These were beautiful old houses, high ceilings, and an angan in the middle. But what I remember more, I saw this when I was very, very young. So my memory of it is very faint because sadly, when Rusi uncle took me again, that whole building had been demolished. But what I remember most of all was that in the middle of the angan, um, there was like a grill. And there was a staircase within the building that led down to the basement below. It was basically as all houses were to store things, to store grain. Now, my mother says that a cobra lived there. And every time one of her dogs gave birth, she gave birth in that basement next to the cobra so that it would protect her puppies. I firmly believe that. I mean, I probably people might think not, but hey. This is another house. And this little baby here is Mani Aunty. And the little boy standing next to her is Rusi Sorabji. Those Sorabjis were an instrumental part of the building of, Del of the Parsis of Delhi and their Anjum, which we will, we will come back to them later. Kashmiri Gate. After 1911, Kashmiri Gate suddenly became the hot and happening part of it. It was really like East End, West End, whatever you may call it, downtown. And everybody lived in Kashmiri Gate. And so there were about, oh God, I don't remember, there must have been about 12 or 14 families over there. These gates stand to this day. And when Zenobia and I went to <laughs> university, Oh, sorry. Excuse me. We'll just get rid of the dog. When Zenobia and I went to university, the bus used to go through these gates. Now it's completely unrecognizable because ITO has taken over. Kashmiri gate proper. Where you see the, just behind where you see these people crossing the road is a little lane which goes left, which was called Nicholson Road. Down Nicholson Road were two major Parsi establishments. One was a Polo Hotel, which was run by Soli Varyava's parents. And the other was this building called Hassan Building, which amazingly to date, and I mean, literally a couple of years ago, somebody went uh, to Mori Gate, which is like a wholesale market for motor parts and things like that. And they said, ha ha. Uh, building you know, so it's like that. It's still known a hundred years later as the Parsi's ka building. A lot of my my aunts lived there. A lot of friends lived there, and one grew up going there literally every weekend. These two little ones are Roshan and Ellen Vanya, who you who. One, Roshan, uh, Roshan has, Ellen auntie sadly passed away, but Roshan still lives in Germany. Now let me talk about the families that actually came to Delhi and made it the first person, the first recorded person is now Roji Kapadia, who came in 1880. He came from Bharuj, and most of these people who came, as I said, 
come from Gujarat, which substantiate my story, that if they didn't go to Bombay, they moved either due north or some of them went south. Now, Roji Kapadia had 10 children. In those days, it was very important to have children because they needed to, um, they never knew how many would actually make it. So uh, out of those, sadly, four passed away. But this family has been really, I, I mean, Arnobi still lives here. Homai still lives here. They're all Kapadyas and they've all, I think, I mean, from six children, they were like, gosh, I'm unfortunately I haven't been able to speak to Novi about this, but let me tell you, it was a family of about 50. And all of them are still in touch. All of them are incredibly successful and all of them still have entrepreneurship. So many of them are professional. The other interesting person who came, though there's not much said about him later, was a person called Adesha Narima. Now, he worked for a company called, uh, I'll have to look at this. Yes, he worked for a company called the Asiatic Petrol Company, and he supplied kerosene. And uh, because the Delhi Darbar was going to happen in 1911, the Delhi, the British told him that, sorry, you can't uh, supply because we've given the contract to BOC. Now, being the enterprising person he was, he read through the contract and found the loophole and said that, uh, that the, the loophole was that if people didn't deliver within two hours, then anybody else could take up the contract which is exactly what happened because Adesha Nariman was sensible enough to stockpile a whole heap of kerosene. And so when BOC couldn't deliver, his company did so and was hugely successful. <sighs> now, where do we go from here? Um, Sorabji's. Rusi Sorabji and Mani Sorabji's father also came to Delhi from Gujarat. And he was in the railways. He spent about four years in the railways. And at that time, uh, the railways and Apollo Hotel at Kashmiri Gate sort of became um, boarding houses for Parsis who came and didn't have a place to stay till they could find a place to stay. Minerva Cinema and another cinema called Novelty, which I don't have a picture of, were the cinema houses that everybody went to in that time. And in fact, at Novelty Cinema were also, oops, just a moment, I will tell you where that is. At Novelty Cinema were held a lot of the weddings. This is the wedding of Rusi Sorabji and Mani Aunty's parents at Novelty Cinema. There's another picture here of the beautiful house. And this house belonged to a Parsi called Mr. Modi. And as you can see, this, is, this was 1939. And this was the full contingent of Parsis at that time. This is, a, a, this is another picture of my mother who, and her friends who are doing the chalk um, what's the other, Rangoli in Gujarati at that time, uh, decoration for a celebration that was to happen. Wait, now let me uh, apologies everybody. This station was the one that came up in the 90s. I, ha I had two excellent um, pictures of Old Delhi Railway Station. One which said, the Eastern Punjab Railway on this left pillar and the Eastern Northern Railway on this pillar. But those photographs are copyright, so I couldn't put them here. But anyway, even the railway platform and especially the waiting rooms were places where Parsis met to have breakfast because 
there was excellent British breakfast to be had at very reasonable rates and to talk to the station master who was Parsi, the station manager who was Parsi, and various others who came along the way. The other very interesting story about um, Mr. Kapadia was that he really wanted Parsis to come and stay in Delhi. So he used to go and nab people at the frontier mail and say, Avoji, Avoji, please, please, Avoji, just stay for a couple of days. I just spend one night in my beautiful city and see what it's like. According to me, he must have only done this in spring or autumn because nobody in their right minds would want to spend a night in Delhi summer, even then, or in Delhi winter. So, but still, he did manage to convince a lot of people and a lot of people stayed. Now I'm going to um, just money auntie's voice is going to run over some of this and I'm going to try and play it. If you will just bear with me a moment. I think I start with when my father was the secretary of the Anjuman. And in those days, my dad was the one who started all these New Year functions, you know. We, we didn't have any functions for Khodat San. So daddy in those days started, to, uh, we would go to Plaza Cinema Hall, which was owned by the Modi, Sarab Modi and Keki Modi. And luckily we had a manager who was also a Parsi, Baman Sasetna. So, with the kindness of the uh, uh, Surab Modi and Keki Modi, we were allowed free show, morning shows for the Parsis on Kodak Sar Road. So, every Kodak Sar, all the parties used to assemble at Plaza Sandaba and we used to go to a good movie. And then, you know, the refreshments were served during the intervals by the Anjuman. And that used to be a regular feature. And then, you know what happened, you know, what we used to have, we used, we used all the teenagers to, uh, we, we all used to meet, and you had, we had lovely times, you know, uh, teenagers, I think we were teenagers by then. We had a lovely group, and we were, our, our parents used to meet separately, and in those days, the main center of activity was Kashmiri Gate. In those days, we, we had the Apollo Hotel, which was owned by Mr. Perry, and the manager was Soli Variava's parents, Pelosh Shankar and Banu Bayanti. And they, they had a compound over there, so that used to be the meeting place of all the parties in those days. So what used to happen, our parents used to be sitting with all their, their age group, and we children would have our own circle. So every Saturday, this used to be a regular, every Saturday, this used to meet over there. And then we, all the children, we had our own company. We used to go out for, on Sundays or on holidays. We went out for picnics all by ourselves. Our parents would not accompany us. And we used to, in those days, there were times of the Tongas. Tongas driven by horses. So we used to travel all over Delhi. Our main uh, starting point used to be Kashmiri Gate from near the church where the Manchetis used to live. And that was the hub of the Parsis in those days. The Kapadia family was there, the Manchetis were on the, on the church road, and everything was in Kashmiri Gate. The, where the Apollo Hotel was, that lane was full of Parsis. Next to Apollo Hotel was Chatiganj, where the famous Kapadias used to live. Then down that road, we had Hassan building, which was again full of parsley. Anyway, so that basically gives you a flavor of um, what it was like at that time. Zenobia, will you come in now, please, and talk sure. about how from money auntie's time it changed to yours or ours? Let yeah, me say. sure. Sure. Uh, well, my earliest memories of Delhi are from the 1950s when I was a toddler. And Delhi was, as mentioned earlier, a far cry from the metropolis it is today. 
the outer limits of the city stretched just maybe a little beyond Newton's Delhi. And the beauty of Delhi lay in its tree-lined avenues with, used mainly by a few bicycles, tongas, and the occasional car or bus. A unique contraption in Delhi was the Fatfat Seva, which was nothing but a four-seater <clears throat> built on top of a motorcycle. It was a joyride for children and a great attraction for tourists in, uh, in Delhi. If you lived in Delhi, you could not escape history. Chani Chowk, the Red Fort, Saftajang's tomb, and many other such monuments were landmarks that you passed on your way to school or work every day. Kutub Minar was a remote outpost, actually unsafe after dark. Today, the city has sprawled way beyond these points. Prior to independence, as mentioned by Shanaz, the Parsis lived mostly in Old Delhi in the Mori Gate, Kashmiri Gate area. How did my family come to Delhi? My grandfather and father both worked for army headquarters. In days of the Raj, the family spent nine months in Simla, the summer months, when the capital was there, uh, used to move up to Simla, and come, they used to come down to Delhi for three months in the winter, December through February. In 1946, when government offices finally moved permanently to Delhi, my grandfather was allotted a bungalow on Circular Road opposite one of the gates of Delhi, Turkman Gate. August 47 brought with it independence, but unfortunately partition, mayhem and riots. Delhi burned for weeks as communal riots sp uh, spiraled out of control. And since our bungalow was across from Turkman Gate, there was no respite from the fury of rampaging mobs. As the family watched, apparently a mosque behind our house was set on fire and a passing tonga along with the owner and the horse were hurled into this inferno. Our immediate neighbors were Muslims. One evening, our family, as they were about to settle down for dinner, there was a furious mob banging at the door, threatening to tear it down and wanting to search our house for our missing neighbors. My grandfather was able to convince them that we had no inkling of their whereabouts. Fortunately, they left, but it was a frightening experience seared into my memory only through its oft-repeated narration. Apparently, our neighbors had been tipped off about this impending threat to them and had left under the cover of darkness, too scared to even breathe a word of their plans to the ladies of our family during a standard evening Gupshap session in the garden. We grew up with such true to life stories. That is Turkman Gate. Delhi Parsis lived through days of horror. Delhi was not spared, New Delhi was not spared either. Minu Kapadia, who had a tailoring business in Connaught Place, his shop was gutted and ransacked because his tailors were mostly Muslim. He later leased the property to a famous, the famous Vora brothers who were silversmiths and who had come in from Pakistan as refugees. Delhi was deluged with refugees. Most of them brought heart-wrenching stories of leaving behind hearth and home, but beyond that, very often an aunt or a sister. And these were our neighbors. So we lived, we grew up with those stories. Partition was something very central to our lives. Our family also lost a lot of Muslim friends and colleagues who had left for Pakistan. And every chance encounter or a trickle of news would evoke a surge of memories and joy. I remember how thrilled my father was when he bumped into a classmate by the name of Kutub Hai. His, this this, this uh, Kutub was a classmate from Bishop Cotton School, Simla. And they met at my brother's annual sports day event at uh, the National Stadium. Mr. High was on assignment with the Pakistan High Commission. And unfortunately, given the nature of their assignments, they decide it was, decided that it was better if they didn't meet. My father was quite crestfallen that evening. Several Parsi families resided in the Connaught Place area. This was the circular stately colonnade of a shopping center with a central park where a police band used to play every Sunday evening. 
Here, Mrs. Jarbai Modi ran a Parsi guest house where my grandparents, along with their children, would come and take up residence in the winter for three months. It was here that my Fui Nargish met her future husband, Japur Jambu Sarwala, who was a pilot with Indian Airlines. Those days, pilots had to make their own arrangements for overnight stays as Delhi had just two five-star hotels. Shirin Bhai Mehta, Shanaz's grandmother, ran another guest house in Connaught Place opposite the Odeon Cinema. The Republic Day Parade used to go past their house and we had a standing invitation to view it from their spacious veranda, lounging on armchairs with beer and Parsi delicacies. It was the ultimate luxury. In 1956, my father was allotted a government flat in INA colony across from Saptajang Airport. We were the only Parsi family in a five mile radius and viewed with a lot of curiosity. Parsi identity was still a bit of an enigma in the North. As a child, I remember having to answer a barrage of awkward questions from neighbors. Uh, Tum log kon ho? Tumara dharam kya hai? Strangely, it was often objects around the house like the ever-present Godred steel cupboard that would come to my rescue because even then they had all heard of the Godrejas. Achha, you belong to that community. Okay, we understand. On the plus side, our house was a stone's throw from Saftajang Airport that had started operations in 1929 and was Delhi's only airport until 1962 when operations moved to Palam. It was used extensively during the Second World War and also during the first Indo-Pak War of 40. 7.48. As a treat, my grandfather would take my brother and me to the airport's restaurant for a treat. With its wide balcony, cane furniture, and a commanding view of the runway, it was an excellent place. We would be served by men and waiters in uniform with turbans and turras, and our favorite snacks would come on a tray along with a bottle of a newfangled American drink called Coca-Cola. If we were lucky, an aircraft would pull up a few feet from the terminal building and you could watch the passengers and crew disembark, while the occasional glider ambled past in silent grace. At the far end of the airport was the Delhi Flying Club, established in 1928 with two moth aircraft named Roshanara and Delhi. Roshanara was the second daughter of Emperor Shah Jahan. The secretary and chief engineer was a Mr. Tara Chand Mehra, whose wife, Putli, was a Parsi from Kanpur. The Mehras lived in a quaint little cottage along with their daughter, Kutusha. We visited them often since their house was just a 10 minute walk from us. In the 70s, one of Uncle Mehra's students was a Rajiv Gandhi, a well-mannered, unobtrusive young man, often seen at the club. We never dreamt that a decade later he would become prime minister. A couple of years later, Mr. Mehra had another student, Sanjay Gandhi, whom he had to pull up, rein in, and ban from flying as punishment. But that is a story for another time. In the 50s, the Delhi Parsi Anjuman complex at Delhi Gate comprised of the one storied Mengusi Dharamsala and the small Agyari that Shanaz showcased in her presentation. The road outside is Bahadur Shah Zafar Marg, named after the last Mughal emperor. Near the entrance is the Khuni Darwaza, which you see in this picture, a reminder of bloodied Mughal successions to the throne. It was here that Aurangzeb displayed the head of his executed brother, Dara Shikok. In Delhi, History stares you in the face at every corner. All functions were held on the terrace of the Dharamsala. There was no Bhivandiwala Hall. Across the road was a popular and convenient picnic destination, Firosha Kotla. Originally built as a fort by Firosha Tughlaq in 1351 and later converted into the famous cricket stadium. Piping hot food used to be ferried across from the Dharamsala while zestful teams played games of seven tiles and everyone 
lustfully joined in the singing of popular hits of those days like Hi Lily, Hi Lo, and Ke Sara Sara to the accompaniment of a mouth organ played by a vivacious young teenager by the name of Soli Varyava, a dear friend of all of us. Dr. Sorabji Shroff was the president under whose patronage the Anjuman flourished. And in 1954, the Bhivandiwala Hall was constructed. With that, there was a spurt of activities. While the social center committee was responsible for all social events, the amateur society was responsible for dramatics and entertainment. There were ample opportunities for children of the community to showcase their talent and to build confidence. The annual fancy dress competition saw our mothers at their creative best. The annual elocution contest taught us presentation skills and made us overcome stage fright. My grandfather knew Melville DeMello, who many of us in the old age group will remember. He was the famous announcer whose baritone voice used to waft over the airwaves whenever there was something to celebrate or on uh, serious occasions, solemn occasions. Melville's presence as a judge added a level of professionalism to the elocution contest. However, what we as children really looked forward to was the variety entertainment program which was staged at Jamshedi Nauroz each year and the month long rehearsals that preceded it. Homework completed, our mothers would rush us to the Dharamsala for rehearsals fathers would come later straight from work. We would be put through the paces of a garba or a ras and one year even a bhangra. We were a pretty boisterous lot, but a loud dressing gown would restore order. But these practices were a delight and created ties that run deep and strong even to this day. Here I must make special mention of a stalwart of our community, the Rayas Bagli. Apart from being our head priest and manager of the Dharamsala, he was an excellent badminton and billiards player, and above all, a great director of Gujarati Nataks. The amateur society was committed to performing a three-act Natak for Navroz each year. The Raya's uncle would get hold of a script, select his cast, and while adults got the lead roles, we teens played sidekick. Practices were a serious business and forgetting lines or missing clues or chatting would put you in his line of fire without hesitation. The only time when rehearsal was disrupted was on May 21st, 1971, when several jeeps drove into the Anjuman compound and a young police officer came looking for the manager. The Rai's uncle beat a hasty retreat, leaving us uh, and, but returned looking rather perturbed and called off rehearsal. As we were leaving, we noticed that a lot of men had disembarked from these vehicles and taken cover on, behind the bushes. We later learned that they were plain clothes policemen, lying in wait for Rusi Nagarwala, who was a permanent resident at the Dharamsala. The next day's newspaper headlines had us all flawed. In fact, the entire Parsi community was flawed. A stack of cash had been found in Rusi's room. Apparently, he had tricked the manager of the State Bank of India, Parliament Street, into handing over 60 lakhs in cash by imitating the voice of Mrs. Indira Gandhi. Undoubtedly, Rusi was an excellent mimic. Apparently, he had garnered insider information on this, this abuse of the system and had exposed the powers that be. To save face, the government, of course, denied all such practices and Rusi was marched off to jail, tried in camera and sentenced to solitary confinement for four years. After some years, my grandfather did manage to get permission to visit him in jail. He told us that the jovial man we all knew was emaciated and broken. Unfortunately, Rusi died a few years later. By circling back to the Delhi Parsi Anjuman, each year the social center committee would organize whist drives, tambola sessions, followed by either potluck or the best of samosas and jalebis from a famous Mithaiwala in Chandni Chowk called Ghantaghar.
that had been established in the 1800s. Dinner and dance to the accompaniment of a live band was standard for all major celebratory events. Young and old would take to the dance floor. None of us had to ever pay a dime for dance lessons. Brigadier Noshir Grant and his wife Minnie would execute a perfect tango and there were several waltzing wonders in the community. The Sui family that came to Delhi in the 70s were nimble at the jive and in short order, they had all our youngsters swinging with them. A popular band that played for us in the 80s was Sebi and the Wings from the Taj Palace Hotel. In his broken English, Sebi would cajole all of us onto the dance floor, which resulted in a lot of jokes which said, Ave next fun function, Misna Kartaha, Sebi ni Navjoche. Other activities included overnight picnics and a popular annual evening mango party at India Gate, which began with boating, followed by stuffing ourselves with chilled langras and taseris, and ending with a round of damsharads and antakshari. Sporting events included cricket matches, billiards, badminton tournaments, and a children's sports day at Christmas. I would be remiss if I failed to mention the annual fete. It brought a bit of community favor to us in the literal sense with savories like Dagni Pori, Patrail, Ghari, and Tarapori Patio flown in from Bombay. 90% of the funds collected were donated to local charities. A stalwart on the board and the social center committee for many years was my grandfather, Jal Masters, who devoted his entire retired life to community service. That's him sitting extreme, uh, on the extreme left. Grandpa was a great sportsman, having played hockey in Simla and cricket for army headquarters. He was, his sense of, uh, his eye for detail and his sense of perfection saw him arrive at the Dharamsala at six o'clock for an eight o'clock function. He, org he would organize a lot of cricket matches, DPA versus local clubs. And I remember one where he hung on to the crease at the age of 75. It was at his initiative that non-Farsi spouses were permitted to participate in billiard and badminton tournaments and later made full-fledged rather than associate members of the Anjuman. Delhi being the seat of government, it always had a lot of government officials and army officers posted over there. With Shavak Snarkolwala, a brilliant ICS officer taking over the reins as president in the late 50s, the Delhi Parsi Anjuman got a flip. It was through his vision and, fund, uh, and fundraising efforts that we got our own Darbe Mir in 1961. In the early 70s, he asked me to, be, to serve as a member on the board and I was the first youth trustee. I learned a lot under his able guidance. Living in Delhi forced the community to think outside the box. Successive boards faced with the inevitable questions of following prescriptive practice versus practicality always chose the latter. For example, allowing Parsis to participate in religious ceremonies, especially funerals, was an absolute no-brainer. This progressive spirit continues to guide the Delhi community that has always punched above its weight. Kudos Delhi, we did it our way and we always should. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zanob. Um, I now have to give thanks to one very critical uh, institution of our community and the people who have, oh, I don't know what's happened here. Just, just a moment, please. Uh, Shani, can you uh, share the slides? No, I'm trying to share it. I don't know what's happened. I have to get on to Zoom again. I think just a moment to share the screen. Okay. Yeah. 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 The uh, the one next to the minus. No. Uh, no. 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 The minus sign. The small screen there. Hang on a moment. The one next to that. Yeah. The one just next to that. No. The, the one on the. Yes. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Thank you. I'm so sorry about that. I want 
I want to mention the shops as one of the guiding lights of our community here in Delhi. So Rabji Shroff started this charity hospital and Meenu Shroff, his two sons, my dear friends, Noshir and Cyrus, and their sons, four generations of Shroffs, have just provided human community service. I cannot tell you how many people, including myself, have benefited through not only their expertise, which is phenomenal, but also through their amazing charity, because that's what this hospital stands for today. And I can say that I started wearing glasses very young, so Minu uncle used to look at my eyes, and the first time he told me, Bita, today I'm very busy. Today, Noshir or Cyrus will look. I looked at him in horror saying, who will look at my eyes? He said, no, sure. I said, no, 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 no. My eyes will get ruined. I'll never be able to see. I'd grown up with them. They were my friends. Never <laughs> for a moment did I think that they'd be doctors in their own right, which they are. And X million years later, next month, Noshir is going to perform my cataract. Mind you, if he told me that his son or nephew were going to perform it, I'd probably have the same reaction. Uh, really, Noshir? But they've been tremendous. And they, I hope, will continue and their children and their grandchildren and great-grandchildren prosper. I, I really am at a loss for words from here. Jenna, may I just come in here for a minute? Yes, sir. certainly. Even with my husband having macular degeneration and being treated here in Washington, our fallback option was the shops in Delhi. I've known them since the age of, I mean, ever since I uh, live in living memory. And my first memory is for, of going to Noshir's birthday party when our car got pulled over by a policeman and I howled because I was so scared. And I always blame Noshir for that. Okay, sorry, I've gone, <laughs> I'm trying to get this right. I'm beginning to feel very computer challenged. Okay, these are messages from Mahatma Gandhi and Abdul Kalam for the hospital. I don't know if anybody will be able to read them. I'm sorry, I can't because Somehow the print is a little too small for my myopic eyes. Now I come to something that's very close to my heart, Connaught Place. This was Connaught Place being built and I'll try and put this little empty space here with a mosque in the corner is what is now K Block and my home. This mosque still exists, it's become ginormous, but never mind. It was always there. So we are talking as far back as 1944, 36. This is later as it's being built. This is K block, my block again. It's one of the first, second round of blocks to be built. This was what Connaught Place looked like when my parents moved in. Our house, similar to this, now has railings. But when my mother and her parents moved in here, there were no railings. There was no water and there was no proper electricity. The water was brought up by a bishti. But still, it was an amazing, amazing space. And my mother could cycle to come to Jesus and Mary nearby. Wengers. For anyone in Delhi, I don't need to introduce the shop. But there is an interesting history here. It turns out that before Wengers moved in, a Parsi owned it. I can't remember his name now, but it was a liquor store and he sold it to the Brits who actually owned Wenger's and later on to the Sardar family who still run it. And they are still the best convection in Delhi. Plaza, no, Odeon. This was across, diagonally across from my house. Of course, I didn't see it in this avatar. It had a different facade, which sadly I don't have. And it's gone into a third facade, which I can't stand because it's sort of become big cinemas or something like that. 
Plaza Cinema, which Mani Aunty spoke about, where all the, the Parsis lived in the building behind the cinema. And this is where all the New Year functions and the badminton matches took place on the terrace. Republic Day. This was how it looked then. And it's so sad that A, the parade doesn't pass this way any longer, and B, even if it did, there was no question of having so many people around because of security. This was the first parade in 1951. Empire Stores, another institution for me where I grew up, between Empire Stores and Odeon Cinema, I must have eaten popcorn enough to last me a lifetime. Mahatas, another institution, and for us, honorary Parsis, because what they have done for Parzor and what they have done in recording so much of our material. Yeah, it's, it's beyond <clears throat> me being able to say something for, but deeply appreciated. This is Sorabji Bilimoria. He was the first person to buy a shop in Connaught Place which, with his son. It was called the Chinese Art Palace, again in A Block, actually near Wenger's. And this says Nart Brothers. Nart Brothers is now in the, in the block behind them. Sadly, Chinese Art Palace was um, a place where a murder occurred, thankfully not to the Parsi family, but to the Chinese family who used to run. Whitman's Commercial College. For every person who learned how to type, this was the place to go to. And of course, YMCA, but Pittman started first. BOAC, Qantas. BOAC is, of course, British Airways. Again, places we used to frequent. To the left of these cars was a wonderful little restaurant called Rambles. That came up in the 70s and it was a, certainly a haunt. I, I'm showing you this postcard because, again, it's Connaught Place as I remember it. The, each road was two ways. Now it's a one-way street. This, sadly, is an institution that's gone. And in its place is a Haldi Ram. What can one say? But Nerula's was our first experience of fast food and the most memorable one. Connaught Place as it was then, the colonnade, the beauty. Connaught Place as it is now. And Connaught Place during COVID, which is a throwback to how it used to be. This is Dasuji Sidhva doing a jasan when we first, when not we, when my grandparents moved into Connaught Place. This is my grandmother and my mother with the first set of borders. My parents' wedding card. They had their wedding at the Imperial Ballroom. I, I didn't know that till I was about 40 and almost collapsed with shock. Imperial Hotel? How on earth? I mean, we, there's no question of even being able to afford one square foot of space there at the moment to stand on, let alone have a wedding. But hey, my parents' wedding. Another institution, Omai de Aravala. What we would have done without her, and frankly, what um, a photographic records of politics would have done without her, I really don't know. She was amazing. And the kind of photographs that she's got are uh, imprinted in our memory. Her favorite subject, Nehruji. the old Rajput. Please look at this and remember it because it's never going to look like this again. My father, an Indian Airlines. This is Saptachang Airport. My father greeting Nehru when he arrived. And my favorite photograph of me on my father's lap on top of Kutub Minar, looking across all of Delhi. We come now to the modern day to our Parsi Anjuman as it stands, this is our Gyari. This is the Muktad ceremonies that we hold in our Gyari. This is the old hall 
and this is the hall as it's been modified. <coughs> this is the old dharamsala, the dharamsala now with the lift. Our very own Dharam Bagli welcoming Mrs. Indira Gandhi to the TPA. And if you look at this picture carefully, the person behind the toran on the left is Rajiv Gandhi and the person in the maro uh, brown sari with the maroon border is Sonia. What has kept us all together? It's been people. And what will we remember? And how will we remember it? The thanks only goes to Parzor and Dr. Sheri Kama's effort to preserve, conserve, and promote our heritage. There were three amazing exhibitions on Zoroastrianism, which have never been held anywhere else in the world. This was Threads of Continuity, which is exactly what I'm talking about. This was the part in, at the National Museum, which again spoke of Parsi heritage. This is a Bombay hub, a reproduction of a Bombay home. Homi Baba's art. Again, we often forget that brilliant scientists are also either brilliant musicians or brilliant artists. And that evening, the wonderful evening where we celebrated Navroz before the exhibition started. There we are. And that, I guess, is all of us. What can I say here? I have to, first of all, express very, very deep thanks. Thank you, Zenobia, for having shared and given so much information. Thank you, Matab and Sana, for your infinite patience, because I bugged you blue for photographs. Thank you, Rusi Uncle and Mani Auntie. Rusi Uncle, without what you have written, I would not have known 90% of the history of Delhi Parsis. Mani Auntie, thank you for your articulation. Kavas Bagli for the photographs of the old Aramga Swapna Little for some of the photographs of Delhi. But most of all, my thanks goes out to Dr. Rukshana Shaw. And people, I hope that in some way this talk has whetted your appetite to know more because Dr. Shop is going to come out with this amazing book on the Parsis of Delhi and on the Parsis of the North. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Kama. I'm sorry, I keep saying Sherry because most of all, thank you so much for giving all of us this opportunity to share our beloved book because that's what it is. And our beloved community. Thank you. Thank you, Shani. Thank you, Shanaz. This was really wonderful. Thank and you. What's smart up to. Thank you so much, Shani and uh, Zenobia and Rusi Uncle. I'm sure you've got lots of things to say, Rusi Uncle, but I do want to continue what Shani just said. Uh, Rukshana is bringing out a book on the Parsis of Delhi which will start now that you've given me these ideas of uh, even to the Mughal times. Yes, of course, we will do that. But going back even further uh, into history, we will look at those angles. And uh, the other thing is that if anybody who is listening or is there any historian over here of Delhi who can add to the amount she's been collecting over the last two years, and add photos or any of the of the of the pictures or paintings or sketches uh, of the Parsis of Delhi or any of the buildings of that time. We would be very grateful. You can contact Parzor Foundation, and we will be uh, finally publishing the book. So it will be a great thing for us to have more material from all of you, and. Uh, Thank you. And now I'm opening up for questions because I think there, there are some questions. Uh, let me just check. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Vajayat has said Khuni Darwaza is named because it was where the sons of uh, Badur Shah were stripped naked and beheaded by Colonel Hodson. 
And uh, Colonel Hodson, of course, was later killed and he's buried in La Martine. But before that, I have got something over here. Uh, uh, Yazad asking, has the population of Parsis in Delhi been steady, increased or decreased over the years? Ava Kullar would have to answer that question. But I am looking at any questions if you have. Uh, uh, okay. I am from Karachi, says Nilofa Marvelwala from America. That just shows how how wow. the diaspora has spread and is listening in. But this is the Shroff is the place which I have visited as my father was also a renowned ophthalmologist. Jamshed Horma Shavania was a great friend with the family. And uh, it says anybody who wants to have any questions. Uh, Okay, why don't we ask for reservations? That is not exactly Beras linked with our uh, exact um, uh, topic today. And okay, uh, we will uh, look at Ava, who's going to tell us about the demographics in answer to Yazad's question, please. <clears throat> yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can yeah. hear you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, we haven't. Uh really taken a census in the last few years, but we did bring out our telephone directory, which we do every few years. The last one was in 2016. And uh, to answer Yazad's question, uh, I don't think there could be a major increase in the community's figures. Uh, what we notice is that the marital pattern is definitely going towards mixed marriages. In 1978, when we had taken out a 100% survey of the Parsis of Delhi, we had found that exactly 33.13% were mixed married, that is non-Parsi spouses. It was when my institute, the Center for the Study of Developing Societies, which had carried out the study at the request of the Parsi Anjuman, when at the 1978 North Zone Parsi Federation meeting, we had presented a paper clearly indicating what the demographic situation was heading towards. And when I reported this to Mr. Nargolwala, his first reaction was 33%. We cannot afford to lose these families. And he was very right because these 33 families were not members of our arrangement. We had unearthed them by putting advertisements in the newspapers and all to find out. And because they were families who had come from Bombay and Gujarat, where they were not accepted by the communities there, they had assumed that the same picture would be here. But the Delhi Parsi Anjuman would not accept them, except that the Parsi spouses must have been going to the Darim here and all that. So we approached them all. We, we, we requested them to join us. We changed. Uh, our rules to make them members. And let me tell you, it has been one of the happiest decisions because the Parsis and the non Parsis have stayed so happily together. There has never been a bone of contention about any issue. Everything has been decided unanimously. And now, every time a wedding invitation card comes, it's a rare occasion when both spouses are Parsis. So it's not that we want it that way, but it's inevitable. And the Parsis, under our wise leadership, have accepted the situation as it is. So yes, I don't think, uh, unless we, we, we are going to revise our uh, directory, and maybe there may be a few additions. But I don't think there will be a very large increase in that. Certainly, 
even if there is an increase, it will be families who are coming here on postings or uh, for millet in the defense services, etc. So that it would not be an addition to the population of Parsi because they would be just relocated from other places to them. Thank you, Ava. Uh, there's a question for you, Shani. Uh, which year did your father, Barjor Italia, migrate from Hyderabad to Delhi? Do you have any idea? Um, I don't think my, pa my father came here as part of Indian Airlines, so it would have been when Deccan Airways changed to Indian Airlines. So it would have been about 1948 or 49. Because in 1950, my father got married to my mother. After that, he became a Ghar Jamai and lived here ever after. Okay. So okay. that was the migration. There's another question which will be very close to your heart from Roosevelt Umrigar. Uh, from one dog lover to another, who is heading the... We don't call them stray dogs in Delhi. We call them community dogs, Roosbe. Uh, the campaign is being headed by Shenaz Italia and uh, Freni Khodaiji. Uh, I will put them in touch with you because he wants details for correlation with the South Gujarat data. And he's given his email. Uh, I will send it on to you. Thank you. See, Thank you. Rusi Uncle wanted to speak. Uh, he okay. had his hand Not up. Okay. okay, please, Rusi Uncle, do speak. We, You deserve to At 5.30 in the morning. Good God. Thank you, Rusi Uncle. Please come on. Rusi Uncle? What happened? Rusi Uncle, please speak. Can you hear I, us? I have, I, I have asked him to unmute. I think it should happen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Lucy Uncle, can you... I've sent you... I, I've made you co-host, so you can unmute yourself and speak now. Maybe we take another question until we can. Uh, For some unmute. reason, he's here. Yeah, he's on mute. Yeah, Lucy, Uncle, you can unmute yourself now. Um, okay. Okay. Maybe we take another question until then. Okay, there are two other people who have raised their hands. I can't make out. Uh, Mata, will you please check? Uh, Vajahat Habibullah. Okay, yes, Vajahat. Shani, please take yes, the question. Mr. Habibullah. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Sherry, this is uh, Vajahat. Uh, I yes. want to congratulate you on a beautiful session. Thank you so much. But also, I wanted to ask uh, what of Maya and Katie Daruwala are they among you? Uh, I don't know. I can't make out there are 100 people here. But uh, of course, they're very much a part of our community. Yes, yes. I that's keep... why I asked. Yes, yes. yes. I, totally. <laughs> I, I, can't, I, I can't make out who, who all are there because I'm watching uh, another part. I'm looking at the questions. So okay, that's okay. Good. Okay. Go ahead. But thank okay. you very much for this lovely session. And thank you so much for having my own. Sorry, thank you so much, uh, Vajayat. No, uh, I just, I just want to thank you. Sorry, I think it got cut off. I want to thank you so much for having me with you today, and also uh, I will, I, I greatly welcome your having Zenobia Masters, my old college friend, also to come and talk to us today. Thank you. <laughs> it's a small world, I must say. It's really a small world. Do we have Rusi Uncle? on because he's yeah. come all the way from yes he's at his mic is on now his okay. mic is on now yeah please Hi. yes <laughs> good. good evening everybody uh, can you hear me now yes yes yes, yes. Ah. Uh, uh, that was a nice presentation uh, and uh, i was touched seeing a uh, little uh, zenob there <laughs> a little I zenob like I'm still little. I'm still little. Her in uh, Jalmaster's hands, 
She was then about two years old. Yeah. You know, you didn't put that picture uh, I, for this program? No, I basically, I didn't put any personal, I put more of Delhi. Uh, there were time restrictions. You might see them in the book that's coming out on Delhi Parsis. Uh-huh. And that's good. And uh, thank you. It was good. And uh, I, uh, it, I think it uh, deserved my getting up so early in the morning. To thank you so much, Lucy, Uncle, because without all your inputs, and I'm sorry, I have made a couple of errors, so I'm apologizing in advance, because I know I'm going to get an email saying, Tain, I bol tu bol you. but I'm quite ready for that. But you know, the thing is in Washington, I keep saying in Delhi, we did it this way. In Delhi, we did it that way. So that now, so now people over here taunt me. They say, so, and what does Delhi have to say about this? <laughs> Good. Nargesh Dabash. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes, Nargesh Dabash. Nargish Dubash, Kashi's wife, recognize me? Jamshed yes. and myself and Anaita heard your speech. It was very, very nice to hear you from. And I'm so glad to hear that. And my little Arish was also here, Jamshed's son. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, God bless you. Yes, all Thank the very best, Shenna Zandi. This is Jamshed. Thank you, Jamshed. Thank yes, you. All the very best. Good luck, always. So please, okay. if we'll have to end now, but please, if anybody has information on Delhi or North Indian Parsis, wherever you are in the world, because I do know that Firoz Pestanji has some information on Punjab Parsis and he is in Australia. So I hope we'll get more information and please send it to the email that has just been typed, parzorfoundation at gmail.com. And just address it. The, the 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 line in the in the email should be Delhi Parsis, and it'll reach me. Thank you so much, everybody. I, I just want to say one thing sure. that I sincerely apologize if I have left people out or if I have inadvertently used the wrong name. <laughs> relax, relax. You can't cover a hundred years of history uh, along with feeding four hundred dogs yes. that easily. God bless. Thank you, Zinu. Thank you, thank you Shani. Thank you, everybody. And Mata, thank you very much. Thank you so much. God bless. Thank you. Okay. Bye. -bye.